to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the apostle paul asked a great question in romans 4 verse 3 for what does the scripture say welcome to our study of the church of christ in this series of lessons we've been examining the church that you find in the bible and what it is that makes this group of people these saved people unique from the host of different man-made denominations that exist today as always we encourage you to visit our website thegospelofchrist.com. If you'd like to have a copy of this series of lessons or any of our lessons on our website, we make those available to you free of charge in DVD or CD. We'll even pay the postage. Just log on to our website. You can fill out our media request form and we'll be glad to send that to you to aid you in your study of God's Word and in your walk with Him as you learn more about His will. If you've got a Bible question, please don't hesitate to email us or write us. We'd love to hear from you and we'll do our best to give a book, chapter, and verse answer to any question that you may have. And as always, friend, we encourage you to visit the Church of Christ in your area. Let them know that you'd like to learn more about the church and the plan of salvation and they'd be happy to sit down and study with you. At the Church of Christ, you'll find a loving, caring group of people who are concerned about souls. As we think today about the Church of Christ, we want to emphasize that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church you read about in the Bible, is unique because of its emphasis solely upon the scriptures and the authority of the Bible. What makes the church stand out today? Why is it so unique in a world filled with so much subjective thinking? The Lord's church. The New Testament Christians, they simply place their emphasis on the Word of God and the Bible as the final source of revelation and the answer to all religious questions. The Church of Christ is unique with its emphasis upon the Bible because we believe the Bible is God's inspired Word. Do you remember 2 Timothy 3? Verse 16 and 17, the Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. What do Christians, what do members of the Church of Christ believe about this book? It is inspired of God. That word inspired literally means God exhaled. When God opened His mouth and on that breath that came out His mouth were the very words that we have in the Bible. This is not opinion of men. This is not what happened after the apostles or Jesus took a poll and found out what was popular. These are the very words of God. Think about the process of inspiration for just a moment. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 says, Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Did God use human instruments like John or Paul or Mark or Luke or Matthew? Absolutely. But when these men sat down with pen and paper to pen the gospel books or pen the New Testament, they were guided, moved by the Holy Spirit. He was the overseeing force. The end product was the very Word from heaven. I think of 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 37. When we place the emphasis on Bible inspiration, 
Paul said, If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that I write to you. Listen, these are the commandments of God. You know, sometimes I hear people talk about Paul and say, you know, Paul had some ideas that came from his culture in the first century. Paul had some far out views of women and worship and things of that nature. And those were, wait a minute now, those weren't Paul's ideas. Those are the commandments of Almighty God inspired in the Bible. In fact, Paul would say, these things we speak not in words which human wisdom speaks, but which the Holy Spirit speaks or inspires. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13. You know, as we think about this idea of the Lord's church placing an emphasis on the Bible and it being inspired of God, really what we're saying is this book is full and complete and has everything we need to go to heaven. I love the words of 2 Peter 1, verse 3. The Bible says, according to His divine power, as God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. When we talk about Bible inspiration, we're talking about God giving man everything he needs to live the best life and to go to heaven. And that's found in the Word of God. You see, Jesus made the promise. John 16, verse number 13, Jesus said to His immediate disciples, many of whom will become the apostles, He said, And He, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. Jesus said, you won't have to speak on your own authority. You won't have to wonder about these things. He'll remind you of what was said. He'll teach you new things. And He will be the force of inspiration that guides you in what you say and do. And friend, that's encouraging to Christians. When we read the New Testament, we're not reading men's ideas. We're reading the Holy Spirit of God's Word given to mankind. Now, let's also realize that as we place the emphasis on the Bible in the Lord's church, we're talking about verbal inspiration. God did not inspire the Bible in, in pictures or movies or it's not just a thought meant for you to take and do what you want with. God put it plainly in words so that it could be understood. 2 Samuel 23 and verse 2, David said, His word was on my tongue. These things we speak in words which the Holy Spirit speaks or inspires. And so when we talk about Bible inspiration, God didn't inspire a thought. God inspired the very words and, and those words are cut and dry, black and white. They're meant to be read and understood. And in the language we have, one can do exactly that with an emphasis on the Bible and it being inspired of God, let's also realize that that means that as the Lord's church, as we look at the Bible, we realize this is infallible. This is not a book of errors. This is not a book of question marks. It has more question marks than it does answers. This is God's final revelation and it is complete truth. John 17, 17. In praying to the Father, Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Uh, when I think about this idea of God's truth and everything we have, how wonderful it is to know we have the perfect law of liberty. James 1, 25. Without error, I don't have to wonder is this really true? When I read the Bible, when I obey the Bible, when I live according to its teaching, when I grow closer to God through it, I can know of a surety this is exactly what God wants me to do. And so what makes the Lord's church stand out as unique? Friend, its emphasis on Bible inspiration makes it unique in that we just simply want to do what God says in His book and in His Word. And so we think about Bible inspiration and our need to follow God's Word. As we think about, though, the idea of placing the emphasis upon the Bible, 
what also makes the Lord's Church unique is its emphasis not just on Bible inspiration, but its emphasis on Bible authority. Meaning that in everything we say or do, we're going to let God's Word have the final say regardless of our own feelings, regardless of the feelings of society, or whatever it may be. God's Word gets the final say in the Lord's church. Now, we find that throughout the teaching of the Bible. For example, the Scriptures teach us that everything we do must be by God's authority. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, and then it kind of defines that, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now notice the all-exclusive nature. Whatever you do. Now Paul, what do you mean by that? Well, let me explain. In word or in deed, do all in the name of. Now, when we sometimes hear people use this terminology in the name of, it just kind of carries the connotation that you can go out and do what you want to do, and as long as you say in Jesus' name, that makes it okay. Friend, that's not good hermeneutic, nor is that correct in understanding what Paul and other New Testament writers emphasized. What does it mean to do something in the name of? Acts 4 verse 7. The Jewish leaders asked Peter and John, by what power or by what name, authority, have you done these things? To do something in the name of means that you have their approval. You have their authority. And so as Christians, we must do everything by the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, let's define that idea of Bible authority just a little further. As Christians, we are taught not to add to or take away from the Word of God. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, this warning is placed before us. God says if we add to His Word, He'll add to us the plagues found in the book. If we take away, our name will be taken out of the book of life. Friend, how serious is it? that we don't put our thoughts or ideas into or that we don't try to take out something God put in? Friend, it's very serious. Our names can be taken out of the book of life and the woes and the condemnations found in the Bible can be added to us if we do that. The proverb writer said in Proverbs 30 verse 6, Do not add to his word lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. When we talk about the emphasis upon Bible authority. If there were a passage that I think just so, so eloquently sums that up, it's 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6. Paul said that he had transferred some things to himself and Apollos for their sake. He was using himself and Apollos to teach a lesson. And then he said, here's the lesson, that you may learn in us, listen now, not to think beyond what's written. Where's the boundary? Where's the line that I need to stay within? Not think beyond what's written. Friend, how clear, how plain, how refreshing that ought to be for every child of God. If it's not in this book, not even going to consider it. If it's in the pages of this book, that's what we're going to do. I'm not going to let my thinking about Bible matters, about salvation, about the church, about what God expects of me to vary beyond the bounds of this book. Don't think beyond what's written. As it relates to Bible authority, let's also realize that human tradition has no place in this realm. Jesus said in Matthew 15, verses 3 through 9, He prophesied or told about the Pharisees, and He said, Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people honor me with their lips, they draw near to me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me. Why? In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. What about all these commandments men may place? What about human tradition that becomes doctrine? Jesus said, that's not the way it ought to be. Jesus clearly taught that was hypocrisy, that was a pseudo drawing near to Christ that will not 
make the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, happy. And so we want to emphasize in the Lord's church that the Bible is inspired, that it is our sole authority, and that we absolutely must do what God says. Now, let's think about for just a few moments how that we try to put in the Lord's church, how do we try to emphasize Bible things? And we want to put the emphasis again on letting the Bible give us the answer. For example, we want the Bible emphasis in the Lord's church to simply be on God and His love. Oh, I want you to think about just how much God loves you and God loves me. Here's a powerful emphasis of the Bible. God so loved the world. He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. What's the emphasis of the Bible? God desperately. God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. While we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man one might die, yet perhaps for a good man someone might dare to die. Listen to this. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Behold what manner of love the Father has showered upon us, bestowed upon us, that we can be called children of God. Let's let the emphasis of God's book be the emphasis of the Lord's church today in that we want men and women to see, to hear, and to know about the God who loves them desperately, who wants them to be saved. Let me illustrate that in just how much Jesus loved mankind. One of my favorite verses is found in 2 Corinthians 8, verse number 9. The scripture records this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that we, through His poverty, might be made rich. How much did Jesus Christ love mankind, left heaven, came to this earth, didn't even have a place to call His own, didn't even have a place to lay His head, lived as a pauper, He gave all that up, died, suffered, was crucified, so that one day I could share in the beauty and splendor of that place called heaven. 1 Peter 2.24 says it this way, He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. As we think about emphasis that the Bible gives us an emphasis that we want to find in the Lord's church today. In the Bible, there is indeed an emphasis on forgiveness. Oh, there's no doubt. There's an emphasis on sin. Sin's the bad news. The Bible says, all have sinned. Me and you, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Scripture records there is none righteous no, not one. Romans 3, verse 10. And because of sin, the wages of that sin is death. Romans 6, 23. And sin will separate man from God eternally. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. And Ezekiel 18, 4. But now, here's the emphasis that we find with the love and the message and the hope through the sacrifice of Christ. Because of Jesus' sacrifice and through obedience to the gospel, the emphasis of the Bible is forgiveness. God wants all men to be forgiven of their sins and to have the hope and the joy of living with Him forever. Jesus illustrated forgiveness in one of the greatest scenes. Matthew chapter 26, as Jesus is preparing to institute, teach His disciples about the upcoming event of the Lord's Supper. He says this as He passes around the fruit of the vine. He says, This is My blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. You will call His name Jesus. He will save His people from their sins. Matthew 1 verses 18 through 19. When I think about forgiveness, I think of the words of Hebrews 8 verse 13. 
God said, I'll be merciful. Hebrews 8 verses 12 and 13, I'll be merciful to their sins and their lawless deeds. I'll remember no more. What a wonderful emphasis God places on the forgiveness of mankind. I can be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 1 verses 4 and 5. Though your sins be as scarlet, God said, I'll make them white as snow. Isaiah chapter 1 verse number 18. God will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Micah chapter 7 verses 18 and 19. And we hear that wonderful proclamation. When the gospel is preached, when men and women on Pentecost hear the message of Jesus, they accept that. They're told to repent and be baptized and listen to this. For the forgiveness or remission of sins. The God of heaven, the emphasis is the God of heaven longingly desires for people to obey His will and be forgiven of sin. You know, as we think about a, another emphasis in the Bible that we want to especially emphasize in the Lord's church today, that's an emphasis upon faithfulness. Christianity is not just a name or a title you wear. Christianity is not something you do on Sunday. Christian living is something you must do every day of your life. Luke 9, verse 23, Jesus said, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul said, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. Romans 12, 1 and 2, and Galatians 2, verse 20. But to sum it up best, in the words of Jesus, in Revelation 2, verse 10, Jesus said, be faithful until death. Friend, we want to emphasize that God wants and expects and deserves our faithfulness to the very last breath that we take. Another emphasis that we find in the Bible and no doubt ought to come from the Lord's people as well is an emphasis upon baptism. What did Jesus teach in the New Testament concerning baptism for His church? Well, friend, the Scriptures are not silent on this matter. There aren't just a few scant passages here and there. The New Testament clearly teaches baptism is essential to salvation. Baptism is how one gets into Christ. And baptism is how we're added to the Lord's church. Now, let me illustrate from the Scriptures. Is baptism something I must do to be saved? Well, let's let Jesus tell us. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Did Jesus say you've got to believe and be baptized to be saved? He absolutely did. Mark 16, verse 16. Jesus said in John 3 and verse 5, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Did Jesus say you've got to be born of water to get into God's kingdom, which will ultimately be those in heaven? He absolutely did. Well, what else do we find about baptism in the New Testament? Acts chapter 2, verse 38. The Scriptures teach us that to be forgiven of sin, one must be baptized. When they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? We realize the blood of the Messiah is on our hands. It was for our sins He died. What do we need to do to get right with God? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. Case example, Saul of Tarsus had the blood of Christians, no doubt, on his hands likely, taken some of those to jail, stood there at the stoning of Stephen. When Saul is presented with Jesus on the road to Damascus, Lord, what would you have me to do? You go to the city and I'll tell you what to do. And Ananias comes to him. And that account is told to us in Acts 22 verse 16. And Ananias walks in and says to Saul, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Are sins washed away at the point of baptism? 
There's no doubt they are. Romans 6 verses 1 through 4 teaches us we contact the death, the sacrifice, and the blood of Jesus in the watery grave of baptism. And so our emphasis in the Lord's church must be upon the fact that baptism is indeed essential to salvation and that we must, we absolutely must teach that as God's truth. In the Lord's church as it relates to worship, we need to place the emphasis where God places it on singing. You may go to various places throughout our country, even throughout your own town, and find that there will be a host of different people using music in a host of different ways, all claiming to praise God. Friend, we simply ask, what does the Bible say about singing? In the New Testament, which is our guide to follow, what does God tell us about singing? Well, here's what He says. Whatever you do in word or deed, we're to do all in the authority by the name of Jesus Christ. And right before that he said, singing to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3 verse number 16. Nowhere in the New Testament do we find Christians authorized to use mechanical instruments. We're told to sing, we're told to make melody in the heart. Jesus and His disciples sang a hymn, and they went out. Matthew 26, verse number 30. And so, our lesson today, here's what the emphasis is upon. We want this book to be the guide. And God's people everywhere, the Lord's church everywhere, places this book as the sole authority, as the inspired Word of God, and as the answer to every religious question. Friend, we ask you today, kindly, lovingly, have you submitted your life to the teaching of this book? Have you obeyed the gospel of Christ? Are you a New Testament Christian? Have you heard the message about Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus truly is Savior of the world? John 8, 24. Would you be willing to change your life? Luke 13, 3. Confess His name before men. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And then would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins and be faithful unto death? Acts 2, 38, Romans 6, verse 4. Friend, we encourage you today. Obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, this is not the your gospel wife. of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1 855 458 3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.